All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Apostolic Gatherings Network. And let's get right into the lesson this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to teach on very powerful, very awesome message um, that is uh, challenging the world right now. And it's coming straight from God. And so for a title, it's God Think versus Group Think. God think versus group think. There's a difference between what God thinks and what a group thinks. And uh, we're going to learn about it today. So if you want to look in uh, your Bible, mm, I feel power in my right hand. I feel anointing and power in my right hand. Praise God. God has done some great things here today. Hallelujah. And all of us, praise God. Hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah. Isaiah 55, verse 8 through 11, and I believe God is going to flow while we're speaking, and you are blessed to be hearing this because God is choosing to impart this knowledge, this wisdom, this anointing unto you. Okay, so Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, God says, and the prophet Isaiah reiterates it to the children of Israel, here's what God said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth in bud, and other produces, produces vegetation, and everything else produces life, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You see, and this is what happens when God speaks the word, when God issues his word. This is what happens when we study his Bible, his written word, and, and get full of his spirit so that it, it can become Rima and become alive in us and perform the work. And then when it's spoken over us or we speak it and it's in the spirit or the spirit speaks, it performs the work. Just like what happened earlier in the Holy Ghost, uh, he said it is done, it is finished, it is, you're, you've received your miracle and, and you get, especially if you get a witness in your body, in other words, a sensation or something that the Holy Ghost is in operation it's a done deal. But here's the deal, is with God, he performs whatever he says because his thoughts are not like our thoughts. His ways are not like our ways. So if our thoughts are deficient or inferior and our ways are, are not matching to his or uh, veering off from the right way, then what he's saying here is, we need to focus back on him and his word because it always performs the work. It will never come back void, meaning empty. God's word never comes back empty. Somebody can give you a promise and they can break that promise and it's empty, it's void, it's no good. God never does that. So that's why he's saying, put your focus back on me, Israel, because my word stands forever. It's truth. You may hear a lot of people say things about different things and it could be a lie. We're going to talk about that in this. Or it could be something they're just trying to embed in your thinking to get you to believe a certain way. Or to get you to respond. Or to get you to go with the flow of the people. But God is saying he needs us to go with the flow of his word and his spirit. Okay, so group think versus God think. Or actually, what God thinks versus group think. So, we're going to talk about thought patterns today. And the, the positive power of proper thoughts and the destructive, destroying, negative uh, power of uh, carnal thoughts or demonic thoughts or thoughts that destroy. Examine the thinking of the people in the story. I'm going to read a story to you in Luke chapter 8, verse 49 through 56. And I want you to please pay attention. Please pay attention. Examine the thinking of the people in the story. As I read it, we're going to examine the thinking and the thought process, and what people believed and acted out. While he was still speaking, Jesus, someone came 
from the ruler of the synagogue's house, because the ruler of the synagogue was there listening to Jesus preach. And they said to this ruler, saying to him, your daughter's dead, do not trouble the teacher. In other words, hey, your daughter was sick, you're coming to the teacher, you're coming to Jesus, so that he could heal her, but it's too late. It's too late, she died. She's done, forget it, it's over. See the thought process of this servant? He's saying it's, it's, it's done. There's no hope. But look what he says here. He said, your daughter's dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe. Everybody say that with me. Do not be afraid, only believe. Come on. Do not be afraid, only believe. Everybody want to say it? Okay, I'll say it for you. Do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, those who had already grasped his, what he was teaching and believing, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourning for her, but he said, now he's walking in, Right? And he made sure all everybody else staying up. And there's people that are mourning, family members and friends, over this little girl that died. He says, do not weep. She's not dead. She's sleeping. Okay, she was dead, but he was trying to say that she was just in a, a sleep. Because that's what happens when you die. You go into a sleep until judgment day. But he was trying to tell them that he was able to raise her from the dead. But here's, watch, watch the thinking of these people. And they ridiculed him. Knowing that she was dead. They were saying, quit it. Why are you doing this? You're, you're crazy. You're a fool. She's dead. Don't you know she's dead? The facts are she's dead. And they ridiculed him for saying that. Because their thought process was not on, this is the God of glory right here, right now. He's sovereign. He's the authority. He's the yes and no. He's the death and the life. He's the resurrection and that he can change all things. They didn't see that. They just thought despair. They had doubt. They had fear. That's why he said, don't be afraid. Only believe and she'll be made well. Notice the thought process of the people in this story. So what did he do? He put them outside. Jesus said, get them out. Get them out of here. They don't want to believe. Get out. They don't want to believe. They don't want to see what they've got right here in front of them. Move them out. They're too negative. They're not going to help the situation. So he put the negativity out. He put the unbelief out. He put the wrong thinkers out. He put the group thinkers out. And he took her by the hand and called saying, little girl, rise. Then her spirit returned into her body and she rose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished. Notice the difference in the thought process. Jesus, he had, he's God. And look what God said in, I, in Isaiah. Your thoughts are not like my thoughts. So what do we need to do? We need to stop what we're thinking and stop how we're processing things and hold on and give Jesus a chance. It's time for us to start to not lean on our own understanding, not to lean on our own thoughts, but to trust in Him and His Word and His Spirit so that He can guide us and direct us so that we won't be left in despair and negativity. But her parents were astonished. So, what does God think is what matters most? Not what the group thinks, not what the, what's going with the flow, not with what society thinks, not with what your friends and family thinks, not with what the culture thinks, not with what the traditions say, not with what the policies and regulations say. What does God think? What God thinks matters the most. Now we're gonna we're gonna hit home right here. Galatians chapter two, verses eleven through fourteen. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to face. Now the apostle Paul is talking about they're having their apostles' conference and the leaders of the early church, and they're coming to have a conference, they're meeting together, and the Apostle Paul walks in, and there's dissension, there's bias, there's prejudice, 
There's things that are going on that shouldn't be happening. The crowd that there are amongst there are mixed with Jewish believers, Israelites, and Gentiles, which means all other nationalities that are not Jewish. And God was saving them all because that's what it is. God is no respecter of persons. God's not prejudiced. He don't care if you're white, black. He don't care if you're orange. He don't care if you're brown. He don't care if you're yellow. He don't care if you're polka dotted, full of rashes, whatever. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what nationality you are. You're human. And he paid the price for you. But look what happens here. The Apostle Paul walks in and he confronts Peter. I would stood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. In other words, Peter, he was eating with the Gentiles. He was eating, eating with everybody else and, and intermingling like he should. It was a proper uh, group atmosphere in Christ. But when they were come, the Israelites or the Jews with James, he withdrew and separated himself. Uh-oh. All of a sudden, more other people, more influential people came. Those that were kind of helping out and, and they were called to minister to Jews. He separated himself. All of a sudden, he goes over there with them. And he all of a sudden starts to side with them. And all of a sudden, drive a wedge in the local body of believers, the church right there. Fearing them, which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with them. In other words, here's what Peter did. He went and sat over there. And so all the other Jews that were mingling with the Gentiles, they all went and separated themselves too. All of a sudden, there's a negative mind think in the group. There's a negative thought process in the group. A destructive thought process, not based on the word of God, but based on cultural differences, based on bias upon nationality and upon previous thought patterns of previous beliefs like Judaism and not after Christ. That's why the Bible says don't be fooled by the rudiments and the propaganda and the teachings of this world or the traditions of men and the religious dogma of different uh, beliefs and men's and organizations and religious uh, 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 groups. He says that are not after Christ, that are not based on the Bible. He goes, because they're just going to deceive you. Look what happens here. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, the right thought process, I said unto Peter before all of them, if you, being a Jew, live as after the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live as the Jews? You're wrong, Peter. You're not standing on the word. You're not standing on grace. You're not standing on the gospel. You're not standing on the what the church is built on, the, the, the teachings of the apostles, to be apostolic. He says, you're veering back into the law of Moses. You're veering back into those things that don't matter anymore. Because God doesn't separate Jew from Gentile anymore. He puts them all into one body, the spiritual body of Christ. He was saying is, you all have the wrong mindset. This group has caused an issue, and it's not of God. We all need to repent. And these are the highest of leaders at that time. So, are we guilty of groupthink and not God think? Because it matters most what God thinks, not what you and I think, and not what the group thinks, and not even what the religious order or the religious leaders think. If they're saying something or teaching something or we're uh, uh, running with some vision or mission or whatever it is or some uh, 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 core values that are not based on the word of God, that are based on someone else's traditions or culture or regulations, we are in, are, are in false doctrine. We are veered off and it's wrong. We can't do that. We cannot decide to go outside of God's word, outside of God's name and spirit and try to do something or live a certain way apart from God. You will you if the end is being apart from God. And we don't want to live an eternity apart from God. Well, so and so said it was okay. I don't care what so and so said. If the Bible says it's not okay, then that's what God says it's not okay. If God says it's okay, then whoever's refusing it, refuse them because they are walking away from their covering. 
They are walking away from their spiritual protection. The umbrella protection of God is only in that we obey His word, obey His voice, and follow after Him. If we don't, it doesn't matter who you're hooked up with, you will no longer have God's protection. God's protection only comes with what God thinks, not with what the group thinks. Let me prove this to you. Let me show this to you. Even, even the world and the secular world recognizes this. Are we guilty of groupthink? Such is the mentality of the collective people involved in a riot. But could our social circles or even leadership cliques be guilty of this? That's what happens in a riot. That's what happens in a clique. That's what happens when people start to believe gossip. It starts to spread and people believe it right away because they already believe what the group thinks. That's why a riot can't be dealt with or reasoned with because they already embraced what the group thinks. So they'll riot and go after it even if they were fed garbage. They believe it because they're not believing for themselves. They're not basing it upon the word of God. The Bible says that God be true in every man a liar. If someone tells you something, you have got to stop your emotions and stop running away into groupthink uh, and stop what's being embedded into your brain and measure it to the word of God. Is it what God thinks and says? Because if it isn't, you better refuse it. Because if you let it embed in you, you will become a part of that group and be deceived. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees and the priests, high priests and religious leaders. He was saying, you are blind leading the blind. You go all the way across the country to make one convert and you make them twofold the child of hell. Because you pumped them full of what you think and not what I think. And you're blind. And you're going to fall in a ditch and so are they. And you're going to go to hell and so are they. And Jesus rebuked them. Because they were coming against him and they were coming against the word of God and what Christ thinks. And whenever religious leaders or anybody or the secular world or people like Herod, the political world in the secular, whenever they come against the word of God, they come against Jesus, they are in error. Do not follow them. Even if they put you to death. Because after they've killed your body, they can't do any more. You're going to heaven. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and you stand for Jesus and you die for it, you're going to heaven. Why would you want to live in pleasure and reject Christ and then them kill you anyways? Or you die in an accident and go to hell? It's not worth it. It's not worth going with the flow. It's not worth getting caught up in groupthink. Because this is not our world. This is not our end game. Jesus and heaven is our end game. Now, groupthink is a term coined by social psychologist Irving Janus in 1972. He's the one that coined groupthink because he was studying people. He's a psychologist. And he noticed what happens. He said, listen, this is really good. Because this even happens in the church. It was happening... Paul had to stand up against Peter because groupthink was happening there. And it wasn't Christ's thing. It wasn't God thing. It occurs when a group makes a faulty decision or decisions because group pressure, peer pressure, lead to a deterioration of mental efficiency, reality testing, and moral judgment. When the group says, this is what we've got to do, and you have no ifs, ands, and buts about it, and you cannot challenge it according to the Word of God, and you cannot test it according to the Word of God, you cannot test it that if it's morally true or something to do, you are caught up in groupthink, and you are having their propaganda embedded in you. And that's what happens with groupthink. So then even if somebody knows something isn't right, they'll keep their mouth shut, and they'll go with the flow because of fear, because they're trapped in the deception of groupthink. That's why there were scientists that knew that the space shuttle should not take off and that it was not right and that there was some fixing that needed to be done. But because everybody else that were higher than them and more influential than them says, no, we've got to take off, those lesser scientists didn't see themselves as good enough to speak up and they went along with groupthink. And what happened? That space shuttle flew off up into the air. Before it even got to space, it blew up. And those people lost their lives simply because someone didn't want to step against groupthink. Please pay attention. This is really good. This is gonna, this is, God is exposing 
everybody's groupthink right now. Everybody's exposing things that are happening in politics, things that are happening in uh, secret societies, the uh, conspiracies, uh, conspiracies that are not theories because they're actually being evidence is coming out and it's exposing the thought process of certain groups that they are not of God. God is exposing, God bless you, God is exposing the reality of religious orders. God is exposing the reality of, of cultures, of, of different ways of life. He's exposing it right now through a lot of platforms, especially internet, especially video, especially uh, 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 through uh, uh, social media platforms. Is this God's thoughts? Are we in God thinking or group think? Now, this is the reason the tactic of embedding is effective in spreading propaganda. This is why you got to be watch out for social media. This is why you got to watch out for conferences. This is why you got to watch out for symposiums. This is why you got to watch out for what you watch on the internet. This is why you got to watch out for what you're being taught and preached to because what people say and what they believe and what they trust initially and they embrace, it gets embedded in them. So then when someone tries to show them the truth, it's hard for them to change and believe because they've already been swayed by groupthink and embedding. You got to watch out what's embedded in you. What is your teacher telling you? What is your professor telling you? I know some people will say, no, that's not what the professor said. And they'll have a heart. Well, that's what the teacher said. Oh, because this is what happened. Really? Who showed you? Who told you? Where did you get your facts from? So-and-so said, oh, but you didn't go and check it for yourself. You didn't go search the word of God for yourself. See, that's what happens with group thinking and embedding. And you lost, you became a sheeple. You became deceived. You just followed blindly. You just followed the line of the people getting ready to like sheep headed to the slaughter. Check it for yourself. Jesus says, search the scriptures for in them you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. Jesus says, search the scriptures. Jesus said, even check him. And he's God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Just because so-and-so said it doesn't make it the truth. It's what God says that makes truth. It's what God thinks, not what the group thinks. And right now, a lot of people are being totally swayed and sucked in by the group think. And you're letting falsehoods be embedded into you. And whatever sect or group you're in, it's happening. That's why there are some even religious people that will say, don't you dare believe in apostles or prophets. You just believe in what we've got established. That's groupthink, that's embedding, that's false. That's false doctrine. Oh, don't you believe in Christianity? Don't you believe in the Bible? Uh, I don't care if they're finding archaeological proof in the Middle East that, that the Bible is true and that there is, uh, uh, Isaiah's name is found on hieroglyphics and, and Ramses, uh, the Pharaoh that's mentioned in the Bible is, uh, it doesn't matter if they're finding Hezekiah's toilet. They're not, it doesn't matter if all these things that they found Noah's Ark, it doesn't matter if they found the, the drowned Egyptians and their chariots in the Red Sea by the Sea of Reeds. Oh, don't, that's all garbage. No, it's not. That is proof that God is true. Hallelujah. This is why the tactic of embedding is effective in spreading propaganda because it causes people to get sucked into groupthink. Many even claim that a group meeting, whether you're at work or you're in a, 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 a group, a think tank, that's what you know, a think tank, they got a bunch of people in a think tank. Sometimes think tanks aren't even effective nowadays is because people are chosen according to if they follow the same flow of thinking as others. That does you no good. You need people in a group, a group that are going to challenge what's thought and spoken, that if it is the right thing to do. So, many claim that in a group meeting, even in religious, uh, religious churches or uh, religious beliefs, whether they're pagan or true, everything, even ed education, whatever group you're involved in. It could be even your sports group. It could be even your your uh, 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 your little group for, 
for crafts, whatever it is, it applies. Participants are told, oh, you're in a safe place to express your ideas and concerns without ramifications. We, this is a safe place, folks. We can say what we believe and what we do, and nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody's going to be held accountable. Nobody's going to be black marked or red flagged for it. But this is not the case when groupthink is the predominant mentality. They can say this is a, this is a safe place to say what you want, and nobody's going to hold it against you. That's a lie. Because if groupthink is predominant, and everybody's going to flow with what the group wants and what the core of that group wants, then it's a lie. It's actually a way of manipulating and exposing those who are against or who are questioning. And therefore, that person is subtly marked and they will push them out and ostracize them or kick them straight out. You don't want to be there anyways because they're deceived and lost and they're going to continue to be deceived. Just like Jesus, they ostracized him, they pushed him aside, they even tried to kill him. And what did he do? He no longer paid attention to them. He just focused on the people that were hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Because it's not about groupthink and embedding, it's about what God thinks. It's about what God thinks. You know, when I went to college for a short stint, professors would stay, say some challenging things. And all the young people that were age 18 to like 25, most of them wouldn't even speak up. You know, and I'm in my late 40s and I'm watching this and I'm like, it just didn't dawn on me how vulnerable we are at a young age. And how impressionable our minds are. And how most of, 99% of the young people there that were under the age of 30 were afraid to challenge the professor or to speak up or to... Involved in dialogue, even if he wasn't trying to, you know, my economics professor. He even told me afterwards, man, I loved it when you were in my class. He goes, I know it's because you're older and more mature. You didn't care if you were wrong or if I was going to correct you or if, you know, we brought things out. It, it made things clarify and understand. And he says it was good because you could see the the people perk up and they would look at you, Charles, and they were like, dang, this guy has got guts, right? But see, that's what it is, is because they're afraid to speak up and challenge or say, uh, this is what I'm getting. Am I getting this right? And I said some things that and he goes, well, no, this is how it flows. This is it. And I was like, oh, okay, I get that. That's right. Oh, okay, I get that. Oh, okay. And he goes, oh, no, that's a good point, Charles. And people are looking around like, whoa. And the reason why is because... When you're young, it's, it's very easy to look up to those who are of a high pedigree and think that everything they say and teach and do is gospel. When that's not necessarily true. So, who governs you? Does the group think or what's being embedded in you through whatever you're giving your mind and your ears and eyes to? Is that what governs you? Or is the word of God governing you? Is what God thinks governs you? Or is the group think? That's why people go get involved in the game. That's why people go and join some club. Because they feel, I feel a part of this. I'm accepted. I think the same. Because if you don't think the same as people, you're not going to join them. So what we got to do is measure what we're thinking and embracing to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? So let's finish with this. Romans 12, 3. For I say, for I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. we got to focus on faith and think soberly according to the word of God. Because Romans 12.2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our thought process. So, what do we got to do? we got to let God's thinking rule us and not the group think. Not the embedded information or fabrication. 
or manipulation or a falsehood. Don't let it get embedded in you. Check it according to the word of God. Check it. Is it morally correct? Is it what God says? What does God think? Not what does G what would Jesus do? Yes, what would Jesus do? But it's what does God think produces what you will do. We must build our relationship with God through his word and prayer so that we can know his thoughts and his voice. Well, I don't know the voice of God. Simple. You're not getting involved in his thoughts. You're not getting involved in his word. And you're not giving time to a relationship with him. That's why you don't know his voice. So we need to change the way we think and change the way we act and embrace his word, embrace the Bible, read the Bible, get into prayer so that his word will get embedded in you Embed the word of God in you so that you will have God think and that you can embrace the group that's apostolic like the original apostles in their Christ think, group think, church think like God thinks. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The same thought process. We must build our relationship with God through prayer and reading of the word so that we can know his thoughts and his voice and therefore be successful, successfully obedient to his spirit all the days of our life. Not to be successful in everything else. Those are byproducts of us being successfully obedient to him. The whole matter is, if you love me, keep my commandments. To be successfully obedient to Jesus Christ, everything falls into place and heaven coming. So my challenge is to us. Who governs you? Who is influencing you? Who do you believe? What are you living? Is it group think? Is it the squad think? Is it the government think? Is it your organizational think? Is it your whatever you've given your life to? Whatever they think? Or is it what God thinks? Is it what Jesus Christ thinks? So let's pray right now. Jesus Let's pray. Please, let's take a moment and pray. Everybody that's here and whoever watching the video, Jesus, you have challenged me. You have challenged us. In the name of Jesus, uh, you said that you would come against every thought, uh, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and tearing down every thought and every thought process and every falsehood and every lie and every deception and tearing it down in the authority and power of the word of God and through your name and the power of your spirit and bringing every thought into captivity of Christ uh, so that our obedience to you can be fulfilled. We destroy every, every lie of the enemy, every propaganda, every deceit and every torment and every, we destroy all falsehood in the name of Jesus. We destroy the stronghold. We destroy the foundation of deceit, manipulation, and lie. All the false teachings, the false doctrine, the, the traditions of men and the rudiments of this world, uh, and the lies of culture, and the uh, policies of governments. Uh, be destroyed in the blood and name of Jesus. And let the word of God, uh, the voice of Jesus, uh, and his concepts and precepts and the truth of his word uh, be brought up in you, be, be embedded in you. Uh, and the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, uh, be built up in you. Uh, in the name of Jesus, receive this word uh, and let what God starts in you, that he perform it and finish it in his day. Uh, in Jesus' name, be built up in Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Receive it. Uh, and we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. In Jesus' name.